Hi, I'm Rabbi Micah Streifer, and I'm the founder and director of La Asok. And I want to welcome those who have been studying with us for weeks and those who are joining us for the first time for Tikva Through Text. The idea here is to find some hope through our study, through our connection, through our connection both with our own tradition and with one another. And without further ado, because we only have half an hour, I want to turn things right over to uh, my friend and colleague, Rabbi Evan Yakar, who is the rabbi of both South and North Lake Tahoe uh, congregations. Before we do that, let me share my screen. We're going to say a blessing together, and um, <clears throat> and then we'll launch into our study. So if you'd like, you can unmute and join us for the blessing for study. Baruch. Blessed is the one whose mitzvot bring holiness to our lives, who commands us to immerse in, to engage in words of Torah. So I'll turn things right over now to Rabbi Evan Yakar. Oh, before we do that, sorry, let me just encourage everyone, please put your name and your location into the chat. Uh, so we can get to know each other a little bit. And if you have thoughts or comments during the, the study, um, Evan, as long as it's okay with you, um, we'll ask people to raise their hands electronically and or put ideas into the chat. I don't know where you put the chat right now. So Rabbi okay. Evan Yakar, take it away. Bokertov, good morning. And Chagarim Sameach, a, uh, a joyous festival of lights uh, coming to all of us in uh, just a few hours. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Streifer. It's such a joy and honor to, to be part of La Asok and been hearing about it for uh, a decent amount of time now as uh, as it's launching and the ideas have been percolating. It's wonderful to see all your faces and also a, a welcome to one of my community uh, members here, John Kuzmik. Wonderful to see your face this, uh, this morning. Um, I want to briefly take a moment to dedicate uh, this half an hour of study, this moment of study with you all to the uh, memory of Rabbi David Ellenson. Rabbi David Ellenson is a past president of HUCJR, Hebrew New College Jewish Institute of Religion. We just received news this morning that he died. Um, and uh, he was president of the College Institute when Rabbi Streifer and I were both in rabbinical school. Uh, an amazing light, an amazing neshama, an amazing scholar, and just a, a wonderful soul. And our, um, as we bring light uh, this evening with Hanukkah, May um, the light that has gone out in our world and our Jewish world um, of Rabbi Ellenson, may we uh, help make his memory a blessing and may our study this morning truly honor the gifts he has given us directly and indirectly. I want to start with a brief anecdote um, because for me, it's, it's really about this concept of tikva, concept of hope. And the anecdote is about um, not unique to Lake Tahoe, but in our own way, it's unique to the way we live Jewishly here. Um, as we like to say, we've got our own, sometimes our own brand of mountain Judaism. And one of those things is the way that we share Judaism with the wider community. You can ask me later after our short half hour about why there's now a bear in the Hanukkah story that is unique to Lake Tahoe. It's a wonderful story. Um, but one of the things that my partner Rachel and I have done for a number of years now is one of the nights of Hanukkah, we have... Uh, try to have a Hanukkah party, we really focus on non-Jews and non-members of the community. We reach out to our circle of friends, our kids' friends and their families. We want to share the light of Hanukkah and live the mitzvah, the commandments of Pursu Menisa, of publicizing, sharing the miracle, which is the commandments of Hanukkah, with the wider community. It's a wonderful minha custom, a tradition that we've developed. This year, it's been a little hard. It's been hard to imagine how to share that joy with others in the wider community for reasons that I think a lot of us might understand and feel. So my partner, Rachel, sent a message to two of our dear friends, who um, a couple in Israel who we've known for a number of years now and recently spent uh, a couple months with on sabbatical this past spring. Shani and Onit are their names. Sent a, we were going back and forth, and Rachel sent a notice. So it's really hard for us to imagine having this, this Hanukkah party that we do each year, just not sure we can find it in ourselves, Rachel wrote to them. And they both responded immediately. Clearly they were in different places, but they responded immediately with the same message. Oh my gosh, you must have this party. This is what Hanukkah is all about. It's about the hope, it's about the light, because if you don't, Hamas has won. And without going deeper into the message, 
That is the feeling. That is what tikva is really all about. It's the uncertainty. It's the reality that we don't know what a next step might be a moment from now or 10 years from now or beyond. Yet, perhaps, maybe, if we just find that hope, if we find it within ourselves, see it in others, if we look out and see it wherever it might be found, that's where it can grow and where it can come from. So I share that anecdote because that inspired me to look into Echa, Lamentations, which is customarily part of our morning rituals, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, right? Specifically Tisha B'Av. And I found this verse and a couple of modern drashot from colleagues around the world that inspired me to share. Yiten ba'afar pihu, ula yesh tikva. Let him put his mouth to the dust. There may yet be hope. So the context, right? This is our tradition teaches the prophet Jeremiah wrote Echa, wrote Lamentations. We're, we're in exile. We're in not a sense of home. We're in despair. The opposite of tikva, perhaps by some accounts. The opposite of possibility. And the first thing I noticed when I looked at this verse more closely was let him, this person, the person living in exile, is this referring to the whole people of Israel? Is this referring to each of us? Is this referring to just a member of the Jewish people? We know it's not referencing the divine God mystery of creation because it's not capitalized in the translation. So our understanding would tell us, our, our history of interpretation would tell us it's, it's a human. And what is afar? What is dust? I'll open that up if somebody wants to share. What might be dust? What is put his mouth to the dust? You can raise your hand or unmute. I'll give it another couple seconds. And then I'll share my thought. But if someone has a thought, what, what is it? Put his mouth to the dust. Yeah, uh, hammer, last name hammer. I see lots of hands raised. Um, the one of a couple of the blessings to uh, the patriarchs that we've read in recent weeks uh, says, I will make your descendants like the dust of the earth, not the stars or the uh, grains of sand on the seashore, but the dust of the earth. And that's a different kind of a phenomenon, some people have said. And that's what this reminds me of at this particular time in the Torah cycle. That's Beautiful. all. Thank you so much. Anne, Anne, if you share your thought on dust, and then we'll take Susan, and then I'll share mine. Well, it says in the Torah, we came from dust. So dust could represent rebirth, life. There's hope yet. We will be born into life again with hope. Beautiful. Thank you. Susan. You have to unmute. Okay. As usual, I'm going to rearrange things a little. The way I see this is it might be read, let them put their mouth to their despair. Mm. There may yet be hope. And if you put your mouth to your despair, and I actually am in some despair right now, um, and embrace it and allow it to become one with you, there may be a way that I, we, I, they can find hope and find a way out. Beautiful. Thank you all for sharing, right? So dust could be us, the descendants, dust of the earth. Dust could be our source, our origin of earthly organic material. Dust could be euphemistic for despair, right? Feeling uncertain, lost, perhaps. There's two that came to me when I was looking at this uh, a, a few days ago and really diving into it. One was in, in the Givirot prayer, that one of the parts of the Amidah, we talk about God, a power of the divine God mystery of creation, which I believe we are the agents of, keeping faith with those who sleep in the dust, right? Those who sleep in that basic material of the earth, the organic part of the ground, who don't have necessarily hope, but we, or God through us, keeps faith with that, 
reality, that existence. The other, it's not the same word, but it's the same meaning. In, the, in, in uh, Talmud Sanhedrin, uh, there is a interpretation of Esther's actions and the story of Esther in the book of Esther about she didn't have control of her own actions. She was like karka olam, the dust of the earth, going whichever way the wind blows. And when I think about putting the mouth to the dust, it's, it's I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what my possibilities are. I don't maybe not even have possibilities. I'm just at the will of the forces of the world, of earth, of nature, of God divine. And yet the second part of the verse, the transition, ulai, the translation here, there may yet, I see ulai as perhaps, or maybe, there may be hope. Perhaps there is hope. We might have the possibility. But again, the beginning of the verse takes us to that low level, that base level of the ground of despair. Some would argue in some modern interpretations of the opposite of hope being fear, that fear has become so gripping that hope is not possible. As I looked at this, I came across a teaching by Rabbi Stephen Fuchs, who inherited this teaching from the ambassador, Rabbi David Saperstein. I'll call it a modern midrash. I don't know the original source, but this is where I found it from. Once there was a man who traveled to Sodom, every day asking the people there to repent their evil ways and to change. They scoffed at him and mocked him, but every day he would return with the same message of repentance. When he returned home, his wife and family chided him. Why do you go down there day after day? Don't you know those people will never change and become like you? You may be right, the man would answer. Perhaps, Ulai, perhaps, maybe, those people will never change and become like me. But I must go down there day after day, so that God forbid I do not become like them. And so, even in the face of wickedness that defines, defies description, we must never abandon hope. Rabbi. Yeah, I've never heard that story before, but it, it seems to me that it, in that story, hope is somehow associated with stubbornness in, in a good way. That is to say, <clears throat> what we used to call stick to itness, right? I will continue to believe this even in the face of all the evidence that shows me the opposite. And that maybe that's the only way that change ever happens because people continue to believe in the possibility of goodness, even in the face of all the pain and all the suffering that's in the world. And that's the kind of stubbornness that actually leads to hope. I, I love that. And I, I've been, it's been resonating for me as commitment and commitment to our values commitment to our intention, our integrity. And, and it's almost both directions, a negative and a positive here for me, which is what grabbed my attention. First, it was the word perhaps, because that's, that's what I've been focusing on in this, in this cycle of seeking and discovering and holding on to our hope, having commitment to hope is this perhaps, this ulai, perhaps if we can just, whatever that might be, right? But the commitment and the, the positive and negative is the people of Sodom, According to our tradition, they were committed to their evil ways, right? That there was nothing possible for their um, repentance, for their moving in the right direction. But also the flip side, this man who would go and try, committed to what might be possible, the perhaps, right? The perhaps that they might change, they might see what's possible. Uh, Alfred. Yes, um, this brings me to mind the uh, Heschel readings, uh, Micah, that uh, sin begins with, what, is it indifference or uh, um, apathy? Because the, the man going to Sodom does not allow himself to become apathetic. Mm. If he would allow himself to become apathetic, he would become more like the people of Sodom. Uh, you know, that's my thought. Thank you. I, 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 I'm thinking a lot about 
what is the opposite of tikva, of hope, right? That we've got despair. We often go to despair as a, a feeling or an emotion, not one of the core psychological defined emotions, but despair being the opposite. And then fear. I wonder, and I'm going to put this out there to you all, is apathy the opposite of hope? And that's a question I want to ask following up on Alfred's point. Anyone else have a thought? Is apathy the opposite of hope? Yeah, well, just, just to follow up on what Alfred said, Heschel would say so. Heschel, I mean, I don't know if he would, I don't know about the opposite of hope, but Heschel would say that there is no such thing as indifference in the face of evil. And he was talking about the civil rights movement when he said that. Um, I think it was from his 1963 speech on religion and race. But if there is no such thing as indifference, then, you know, in the face of evil, then if you're indifferent, you are evil, which means that apathy, we fall down on the side of, of evil as opposed to the side of good, if we're not actively doing good in the world. Anyone else have a thought on, is apathy an opposite for hope? My, Alfred, do you still have your hand raised or is that from before? Okay, Susan. Uh, I don't think it is. Um, just because I think about language a lot in general, because I read a lot and think a lot, and there's apathy that can come kind of naturally. Um, like, for example, two years ago, I broke my ankle very badly. And for six weeks, really, I was pretty much confined to my bed. And that brought on a lot of apathy, but it didn't bring on despair. Um, and I never abandoned hope in that case that things would improve. So apathy is sort of passive and i think if you're talking about wicked wickedness and hope you need something that is active to use as a word and even in the face of wickedness or even in the uh, even in the face of despair even in the face of uh trauma or trial would be for me a better word thank you and if hope is the faith and belief in things that are difficult to obtain then i would say despair hmm. disdain despair is walking away Thank you. Uh, Kuzmik, John. Rabbi, I've, I've struggled with your thinking or, or suggesting that the opposite of despair is fear. And I think it really is despair. And I think this story suggests that apathy and difference and difference to the ability to change others is is the leads to that despair indifference leads to despair thank you it's a caution for us all i think for sure for sure um lauren um i would sort of side with the woman that spoke a moment ago i don't think that apathy necessarily is evil we as Jews are difficult on each other and we're difficult on ourselves. That's part of our religion. And I'm not sure we need to complicate that more, but we need to recognize that this commitment on the part of the character in the story 
that's what's what that we that's what we need to celebrate. And if we find apathetic people in our lives, maybe we need to celebrate them more um, and give them more power. And maybe that's a more positive attitude or a more positive take on this, at least for me. Beautiful. I, I want to lift up one piece of that, right? That even when we find those who are indifferent, apathetic, in despair, totally fearful that they don't have any hope and might appear to us or feel to us as negative or problematic or challenging, it's still kayab, it's still upon us, incumbent upon us to lift them up, to bring them something and keep trying as the person in the story to bring that tikva, that hope perhaps um, to them. M my, my take on this apathy hope question is that apathy might be a symptom of not having hope, right? That when we lose hope, whatever the opposite of it might be, when we're in that place, but we don't have hope, we become apathetic. There's no change I can make. There's nothing possible. The ulai, the perhaps, the maybe is only, maybe it just is, this is just my lot. This is just the way it's going to be. Another use of this ulai, this perhaps that caught my attention when thinking about hope in the last you know, couple of weeks since I've been given this honor to, to be with you all, it is that story of Sodom and Gomorrah. I only brought an excerpt. I, I, I imagine not all of us maybe, but many of us are familiar enough with the story, right? At first, God might be hiding from Abraham what God's going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy them. Eventually, Abraham argues back with God, the divine mystery of creation, pushing God first with this word, ulai. What if, perhaps, maybe, ulai yesh chamishim sadikim, there should be 50 innocent. Innocent isn't the best translation. Righteous ones. Tzedek, those doing tzedakah, not just charity with monetary, but tzedakah acts of righteousness within the city. Will you then wipe out the place and not forgive it for the sake of the innocent 50 who are in it, the righteous 50? Far be it from you, capital, God, to do such a thing, to bring death upon the innocent as well as the guilty, so that innocent and guilty fare alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? And Adonai answered, if I find within the city of Sodom 50 innocent ones, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. And as the story goes, diminishing by five at a time until we get to the founding principle of minion of 10, right? That if there's, if there's just enough to impact the rest of the city, then God will spare the city. But they're not to be found ultimately, and the story goes to that horrible place of destruction. But again, Ulai, the perhaps. Is Abraham? demonstrating, my question for you all, is Abraham demonstrating tikva, hope, in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? And if so, what's it for? I'm going to add a layer to my question while you're thinking about if you want to respond or not, right? Is Abraham hoping for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah to repent and change? Is Abraham hoping for whatever number of innocent or righteous to survive? Or is Abraham hoping to impact God, the divine mystery of creation? Susan. I said, that's tricky. I, I think that Abraham might be holding out hope for the fate of the human race, although wiping out those two cities because he is the patriarch has not too much effect on, on that, but maybe that's what he's pleading for, perhaps amongst all of us. There are at least some who are righteous 
and maybe we can follow their lead and become righteous as they are. Uh, otherwise, I don't know. Thank you for sharing. As Bob unmutes and we hear from him, I just share from the chat, Lauren wrote, no, Abraham is trying to maintain the story of divine and for me, human commitment. Bob. Remember that Hashem sets this up by saying to himself, shall I share this with Abraham? Shouldn't I tell him this where I hope that he will be the patriarch of the Jewish people. Well, that isn't quite what he says. Uh, but the hope that uh, Abraham expresses, whoever it was directed at, was induced by Hashem. And maybe that's what we have to look at today in our current situation. Thank you so much. Rabbi. Uh, I, to answer your question directly, I think Abraham is absolutely portraying hope in this story, to me at least. I just think, to me, hope is the ability to see what is not right in front of your face, to see the good that is not necessarily evident in the current. Uh, to use Herman Cohen language, the ought instead of the is. So, I mean, it just seems to me that, again, to, to echo what Bob just said, that is what's necessary in a, in a situation like the one we're in right now, how do you see the possibility of something different than what is right now? How do you see the possibility of people hearing each other's narratives? How do you see the possibility of peace in the midst of the deep darkness that we're in right now? And I don't know exactly how to get there, but it seems to me that that's exactly what Abraham is showing. There is no evidence of righteousness in Sodom, but Abraham believes in the possibility of it despite the fact, despite that fact. I, I am so grateful for the honor to be with you this morning, all of you, and hear your and learn from you and hear the questions and, and for me to think deeper. I looked at these three texts. One is an individual searching for hope and discovery of Tikva, right? When we are facing just our face in the dust, our mouth in the dust, individually, we need to find it. I saw in the second story, the second text, a recognition that we need to see uh, opportunity to bring hope to others. And ultimately for me, the story of Abraham arguing, debating, pushing God, saying, Ulai, perhaps God, more as possible, is that we have impact on God, divine mystery of creation, not as some God of agency, but God as the dwelling place of the world of the universe, as the rabbis teach us, that in order to impact the world and to see Hope, Tifa, when we look out the window and we see what's possible in the world around us, we, we, we are that responsible for that, as Lauren shared, right? Even when those challenging personalities might be there, it's up to us, Chayav, it's obligated on us to find that Tifa, just as our friends Shani and Onit taught Rachel and I, that we must have this gathering, this party, to bring the hope that we're trying to find within ourselves and see in others and continue this tradition of carrying Hanukkah with our, our wider community. As we prepare to light our Hanukkiot uh, this evening, whatever time zone we're in, may uh, one candle uh, share its light with another because the candles themselves are a reminder of tikva, of hope. Because when we take one candle, the shamash, and light another, the shamash still burns just as bright, even though it's given its light to another candle. And as we grow each night, we're increasing not just the light, but also the tikva. Uh, the hope. Chagarim Sameach, and thank you all for being here. And again, Rabbi Streifer, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. I want to thank Rabbi Evan Yakar, my good friend for 20 years now for teaching and for bringing this wonderful text to us. Next week, I'll be teaching. Hopefully, I'll, you'll all still show up as we continue to study hope in the midst of the upcoming festival. Chag Sameach, everyone. Sameach, thank you. Very good.